Chapter 3. Lee Chong's is to the right of the vacant lot. Although why it's called vacant when it's piled high with old boilers, with rusting pipes, with great square timbers and stacks of five gallon cans, no one can say. Up in the back of the vacant lot is the railroad track and the palace flop house. But on the left hand boundary of the lot is the stern and stately whorehouse of Dora Flood. A decent, clean, honest, old fashioned sporting house where a man can take a glass of beer among friends. This is no fly-by-night cheap clip joint, but a sturdy, virtuous club built and maintained and disciplined by Dora, who, madam and girl for 50 years, has through the exercise of special gifts of tact and honesty, charity, and certain realism, made herself respected by the intelligent, the learned, and the kind. And by the same token, she is hated by the twisted and lascivious sisterhood of married spinsters whose husbands respect the home, but don't like it very much. Dora is a great woman, a great big woman with flaming orange hair and a taste for Nile green evening dresses. She keeps an honest one price house, sells no hard liquor and permits no louder vulgar talk in the house. Of her girls, some are fairly inactive due to age and infirmities, but Dora never puts them aside although, as she says, some of them don't turn three tricks a month but they go on eating three meals a day. In a moment of local of local love, Dora named her place the Bear Flag Restaurant, and the stories are many of people who have gone in for a sandwich. There are normally 12 girls in the house, counting the old ones, a Greek cook, and a man who is known as a watchman, but who undertakes all manners of delicate and dangerous tasks. He stops fights, ejects drunks, soothes hysteria, cures headaches, and tends bar. He bandages cuts and bruises, passes the time of day with cops, and since a good half of the girls are Christian scientists, reads aloud his share of science and health on a Sunday morning. His predecessor, being a less well-balanced man, came to an evil, evil end, and, shall, and as shall be reported, but Alfred has triumphed over his environment and has brought his environment up with him. He knows what men there should be and what men there shouldn't be. He knows more about the home life of Monterey citizens than anyone in town. As for Dora, she leads a ticklish existence. Being against the law, at least against its letter, she must be twice as law-abiding as anyone else. There must be no drunks, no fighting, no vulgarity, or they close Dora up. Also being illegal, Dora must be especially philanthropic. Everyone puts the bite on her. If the police give a dance for their pension fund and everyone else gives a dollar, Dora has to give $50. When the Chamber of Commerce approved its gardens, the merchants each gave $5, but Dora was asked for and gave 100 With everything else, it is the same. The Red Cross, the community chest, the Boy Scouts, Dora's unsung, unpublicized, shameless, dirty wages of sin lead the list of donations. But during the Depression, she was hardest hit. In addition to the usual charities, Dora saw the hungry children of Cannery Row and the jobless fathers and the worried mothers and Dora paid grocery bills right and left for two years and very nearly went broke in the process. Dora's girls are well trained and pleasant. They never speak to a man on the street, although he may have been in the night before. Before Alfie, the present watchman, took over, there was a tragedy at the Bear Flag restaurant which saddened everyone. The previous watchman was named William and he was a dark and lonesome looking man. In the daytime, when his duties were few, he would grow tired of the female company. Through the windows, he could see Mac and the boys sitting on the pipes of the vacant lot, dangling their feet in the mallow weeds and taking the sun while they discoursed slowly and philosophically of matters of interest, but no importance. Now and then, as he watched them, he saw them take out a pint of old tennis shoes and wiping the neck of the bottle on the sleeve, raise the pint after one another. And William began to wish he could join that good group. He walked out one day and sat on the pipe. Conversation stopped and an uneasy, uh, uneasy and hostile silence fell on the group. After a while, when William went dis disconsolately back to the bare flag and through the window he saw the conversation spring up again and that saddened him. He had a dark and ugly face and a mouth twisted with brooding. The next day he went again and this time he took a pint of whiskey. Mac and the boys drank the whiskey, after all they weren't crazy, 
but all the talking they did was good luck and looking at you. After a while, William went back to the bear flag and he watched them through the window and he heard Mac raise his voice saying, but God damn it, I hate a pimp. Now, this was obviously untrue, although William didn't know that. Mac and the boys just didn't like William. Now William's heart broke. The bums would not receive him socially. They felt that he was too far beneath them. William had always been introspective and self-accusing. He put on his hat and walked along the sea, clear out to the lighthouse. And he stood in the pretty little cemetery where you can hear the waves drumming always. William thought dark and broody thoughts. No one loved him. No one cared about him. They might call him a watchman, but he was a pimp, a dirty pimp, the lowest thing in the world. And then he thought about how he had a right to live and be happy, just like anyone else. By God, he had. He walked back angrily, but his anger went away when he came to the bear flag and climbed the steps. It was evening, and the jukebox was playing Harvest Moon. And William remembered the first hooker who ever gaffed for him used to like that song before she ran away and got married and disappeared. The song made him awfully sad. Dora was in the back parlor having a cup of tea when William came in. She said, what's the matter, you sick? No, William said, but what's the percentage? I feel lousy, I think I'll bump myself off. Dora had handled plenty of neurotics in her time. Kid him out was her motto. Well, do it on your own time and don't mess up the rugs, she said. A great damp cloud folded over William's heart and he walked slowly out and down the hall and knocked on Eva Flanagan's door. She had red hair and went to confession every week. Eva was quite a spiritual girl with a big family of brothers and sisters, but she was an unpredictable drunk. She was painting her nails and messing them up pretty badly when William went in and he knew that she was bagged and door wouldn't let a bad girl work. Her, finger, her fingers were nail polished to the first joint and she was angry. What's eating you, she said. William grew angry too. I'm gonna bump myself off, he said fiercely. Eva screeched at him. That's a dirty, lousy, stinking sin, she cried. And then, wouldn't it be like you to get the joint pinched just when I almost got to kick up and take a trip to East St. Louis? You're a no good bastard. She was still screaming at him when William shut the door after him and went to the kitchen. He was very tired of women. The Greek would be restful after women. The Greek, big apron, sleeves rolled up, was frying pork chops in two big skillets, turning them over with an ice pick. Hello, kids. How is things going? The pork chops hissed and swished in the pan. I don't know, Lou, said William. Sometimes I think the best thing to do would be just cluck. He drew his finger across his throat. The Greek laid the ice pick on the stove and rolled his sleeves higher. I'll tell you what I hear, Kits, he said. I hear like the fellow talks about it, but don't ever do it. William's hand went for the ice pick and he, held it, and he held it easily in his hand. His eyes looked deeply into the Greek's dark eyes and he saw disbelief and amusement. And then as he stared into the, the Greek's eyes, they grew troubled and then worried. And William saw the change, saw first how the Greek knew he could do it and then the Greek knew he would do it. As soon as he saw that in the Greek's eyes, William knew he had to do it. He was sad now because it seemed silly. His hand rose and the ice pick snapped into his heart. It was amazing how quickly it went in. William was the watchman before Alfred came. Everyone liked Alfred. He could sit on the pipes with Mac and the boys anytime. He could even visit up at the palace flop house.